Hi. I'm Nicola Kegel, and I'm an innovation manager at Sprint, the, feder the federal agency for disruptive innovation. And I'm also the CEO of nanorobotics company Nanogami. And today we are talking about how we will disrupt medicine with nanorobotics. In Germany, we are excellent at engineering machines. We are building world-class cars, medical devices and robots. And at Nanogami, we are also excellent at engineering machines. They're just 10 million times smaller. And this is how they look. Our nanorobots are smaller than a single bacterium, but they are rationally designed to perform a very specific task. And with that, with that ability, we can today, today do tasks with them that we simply couldn't do a couple of years ago. Our nanorobots are ready to be used as disruptive cancer medication. We can use them to create novel medical diagnostics chips. And we can have them work together as broadband antivirals. The technology we use to create our nanorobots is called DNA origami. And Hendrik Dietz, where is he? Um, <laughs> Hendrik um, will now explain to us how DNA origami works. Hendrik um, is the co-founder of several biotech startups. He's a professor at the Technical University of Munich. And he's probably the main reason why Germany is currently leading in DNA origami technology. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'd like to briefly explain um, programmable, programmable nanofabrication with DNA origami. So um, we know that we can read DNA so by DNA synthesis. We can write in DNA by DNA sequencing, but you can also build with DNA. So, and here's a quick reminder how a DNA molecule looks like, a DNA double helix. These are actually two discrete, DNA, two separate DNA molecules. And when they have a so-called complementary sequence of elementary building blocks, they can interact and form a right-handed DNA double helix. Now, let's say you wanted to weave some kind of fabric with a certain contour, like this one here, out of DNA molecules. So if you had that ability, you could imagine that you can stack such contours, different contours on top of each other, to approximate arbitrary three-dimensional shapes using DNA molecules. And the key element to do that is the ability to connect DNA double helices. And the cool thing is, they will do it themselves, simply by programming the right sequences. So let us zoom in here in such a connection. So this is a junction formed between four DNA molecules. And the only thing that you need to do to create such a junction is to program the sequences in a, in a proper way. For example, the first half of this purple molecule needs to be sequence complementary to that molecule, the blue molecule, and the second half needs to be sequence complementary to another DNA strand to which you want to connect, that you want to connect. And you can do similarly um, with the orange molecule. And this idea, of course, in practice, it's a little bit more complex than that. It can be expanded, and you can actually encode arbitrary structures in the sequences of DNA molecules, hundreds or thousands of DNA molecules. Then you make these DNA single strands using chemical synthesis or using biotechnological um, processes, and then you can mix them together, bring them an aqueous solution, and then these molecules will diffuse around, and they will collectively try to optimize the number of base pairs that are formed in such a solution. And as this process unfolds, the structure that is encoded in the sequences will form. So in this case, the structure that is emerging in this illustration is a simple nanoscale rod. It's just 40 nanometer long, 10, 10 nanometer diameter. So it's not a particularly exciting shape. But the really cool thing about this, it, first of all, it puts itself together and it's atomically precise. You can plan it with an accuracy that is much higher than what you can do with conventional top-down semiconductor fabrication techniques, for example. Every little point on this structure is addressable. On this slide, I'm showing you um, a couple of shapes that we have built here in Munich over the course of the last years. Everything 
that's yellow and blue consists 100% from designed DNA molecules that has self-assembled. So, and all of these objects that are flying around here, little cubes, um, bricks, triangles, shells, these, these, these pictures that you're seeing here, these aren't models. So these are, this is actual data. So these are structures that we solved experimentally using um, a certain type of high-end transmission electron microscopy, basically create some kind of tomogram of these structures, but on a molecular scale. So these are experimentally validated structures. They really exist. And to give you a sense of scale, I want to draw attention to this magenta colored uh, sphere. So this actually is a natural object. This is a hepatitis B virus core capsid. It's 35 nanometer diameter. And then this other magenta colored object here up left, that's a protein. So if DNA nanofabrication, you can build on the same scale like all the relevant macromolecular objects that we find in our cells and around cells. So that gives us new degrees of freedom. So I want to quickly recap the technical progress that we have made here, particularly in Munich. So DNA origami is actually not very young anymore. It was invented in 2006. The first incarnation was the construction of sheets from single sheets. We later learned um, how to build arbitrary three-dimensional shapes, um, how to encode them in sequences. We um, learned how to produce such objects with high yields and few defects. We learned how to um, encode structures in sequences that can also alter their shapes. So they can be made a little nano robot, for example, that can put itself together and move its arms and fall apart again on cues. We learned uh, how to successively make even larger assemblies, giant assemblies that are actually even bigger than viruses. And we also established ways how to mass produce the raw materials and also these objects in a cost efficient way. We learn how to stabilize these structures so that you can actually take them, so by themselves they're really comparably fragile, but you can take them out of these conditions and stabilize them so they can really put them into harsh conditions like into the body or you can cook them, anything you want. Um, and then finally last summer we had another breakthrough. We actually made the first prototypes of nanomotors, nanoturbines that can actually do work on the environment. So <clears throat> with all this technical progress in mind, we thought it's time to forge a new industry. So it took us several years to identify sort of the most promising lead directions where we want to uh, use and leverage this fabrication technology. So we have decided to look into biochips, biochips, into cancer therapy, and also into antiviral therapy. And I'd like to ask the next speaker on stage, um, Jean-Philippe Sobchak, who is the CEO, Managing Director of Tilibet Nanosystems, one of our spin-outs. Right, thanks, Hendrik. Uh, so, hi, I'm Jean-Philippe from uh, Tilibet Nanosystems. And in collaboration with Sprint, we're working on DNA nanostructure-based biochips for diagnostics. Uh, so what does this mean? It's a lot of words. Um, basically, imagine if you could uh, take your smartphone and you would be able to run any kind of blood test at any moment uh, just with your smartphone. Or imagine, you know, all of you are doing a lot of rapid antigen tests for COVID. If instead you could do a test that would be able to tell you any viral disease if you have it, which variant you have, and it would be able to do that even for novel diseases that have just been discovered. So this is possible if you leverage semiconductor technology and combine it with the power of these DNA nano devices. So how would we do that? Um, well, first of all, computer chips, so semiconductor technology that basically runs you know, all computers, all, most of modern life. And they can do that because if we zoom in, you know, they're able to build smaller and smaller features every year. And at this stage, the features on modern semiconductor chips, they're only tens of nanometer in size. But what would be really something entirely new that we can't do yet is if we were able to build with individual molecules, as you can see here. And that's where our technology comes in, because we can build with individual molecules. We can build a nanostructure, and we can place different molecules in a controlled way on these nanostructures. And we can integrate these nanostructures into semiconductor devices. And so it's this combination of these two technologies where you can imagine now if we expose such a biochip 
to a sample, whether it's blood or saliva or anything else, where you have molecules of interest that you want to analyze, you can do this on a single molecule basis. You can have the nano device react with these molecules, and it can create a signal that then can be read out with the semiconductor chip. And we're not just, you know, we don't just have these animations, we're actually doing this in reality. Uh, it's pretty difficult to image single molecules, but what you can see here are several DNA nanostructures, and each white dot is the location of a single molecule that we have placed in a controlled manner. And so you can really see we can build with these molecules, we can reliably place them, we can work with many of them, we can also take these nanostructures and assemble them into superstructures to combine the functionalities to achieve even more functional devices. So why can we do this now? What's, what's the difference? You know, what is our advantage? Uh, if you think about traditional semiconductor technology, you know, the factories with which you build these, they cost billions and billions. And the reason for that is because you need all these huge machines uh, to create the smallest things in the world. And that's obviously extremely difficult. We have the advantage, we're not working with top-down processes, we're working from the bottom up. Our structures self-assemble by themselves, we just need to design the sequences and we encode the shape and the function of these nanostructures just in the sequences themselves. And so this means that we can, for example, for a thousand euros, we can produce 100 trillion of these nanostructures with no problem. And that's basically our big advantage. So if you, if you summarize, we can build with individual molecules and we can do this at extremely low costs and in a scalable process. And this is what enables us leveraging semiconductor technology, so not replacing it, but building on top of that to develop these next generation biochips that will be the future of diagnostics. And not just diagnostics, if you think about it, right, what, we, what, what capabilities we have there. You know, we can, we can think in the future we could work on DNA-based data storage or digitally controlled chemistry or, you know, anything, just real, real nano devices. And that's what we can do with the combination of these technologies. Thanks. Uh, if there's questions, uh, we will stick around after the talk and then we're happy to talk about that. Uh, so next now, Klaus Wagenbauer will talk to you about cancer immunotherapy uh, by Plectonic. So good morning. Plectonic is actually working in one of the hottest fields in treating cancer, so-called cancer immunotherapies. Here, you try to use the body's own immune system to combat cancer cells in a targeted manner. And here it is, how it would ideally look like. So you have a tumor cell in red, and small, you see an immune cell. If you would now add the right drug, the immune cell would combat the cancer cell. And this is what you see here. So the cells now stick together, they fight with one another. Over time, the immune system will actually go away and the shape and the color of the tumor cell changes, indicating that the cell was actually, or is actually dead. So targeted by the immune system. That looks pretty easy, right? Well, the whole challenge with cancer is actually that cancer cells are degenerated healthy cells. That means they have markers on its surface that also are present on the healthy cell. The, the immune system doesn't know which of these two cells to target. And in such a case, you would actually create high side effects that lead to the cancellation of the treatment for every patient. Luckily, cells do not only have one marker but like a bunch of different markers. So the whole challenge that we are facing here to combat the tumor cell here in the middle is not only to address the blue or the red marker, but actually both together and using this as a signal to locally activate the drug. Our solution to that problem sounds simple. is a nanoswitch. The nanoswitch is actually entirely made out of DNA what you see here in these gray cylinders. So it has like a stable core and a flexible part in the middle. In color, on the bottom and on the top, you see binders to different types of cells. And that switch has now an on and off state. And this is defined whether 
the orange binder here is actually accessible or not. So in a cellular environment, the switch works as follows. On the bottom, you have a tumor cell, and on top, you have the immune cell. Both cells have specific markers on its surface. So when you now add our drug, it's in the off state. In the off state, it can precisely recognize a tumor cell, and about the recognition of the whole pattern of the tumor cell, it will undergo a conformational change, and now it's actually able to recruit an immune cell and trigger a specific lysis, or let's say killing, of the tumor cell. In context of a healthy cell, so where you don't want any reaction, the switch can also bind, but since it lacks the pattern, there is actually a safety that the immune cell cannot be engaged. Over time, the drug will unbind and nothing is going to happen. And with that, we can actually bring that into a larger context of drugs against cancer. So you, you actually characterize them by two parameters, right? On the one hand, you want them to be really efficacious. And on the other hand, the toxicities should be very low. And there are a bunch of different immunotreatments like CAR T cells or bispecific antibodies, which are really efficacious in some specific cases. But in other cases, they do show a certain profile of toxicity. And our aim is actually not to make the next dot along the line here, but really to keep the efficacy or even increase it and dramatically reduce the toxicity. And this is where we believe our technology comes in. So we believe that our Logibody technology will actually set up a new class of therapeutics, so-called logic-gated antibodies. And the good news now, so Logibody really works. Over the last years, we could demonstrate that we can tackle a lot of different cells ranging from liquid to even solid tumors. We could dramatically reduce side effects and with inanimate models, we can significantly reduce the tumor burden. Based on these findings and our development, we believe to enter clinical validation within the next years. And together with Sprint, we try to bring logic to cancer immunotherapies. But cancer is not enough. DNA origami can do more, and with that, I would really like to hand over to Christian Siegel, the CEO of Capsitech. Thank you very much, Klaus. Um, I'm, I'm Christian from, from Capsitech, and we're developing new antivirals that are based on DNA origami. Why antivirals? So um, viruses, they, they pose a tremendous threat to human health. There are more than 200 viral diseases known, and only very few are treatable with current antiviral drugs. Also, there's no broad-spectrum antiviral, like an antibiotic that you could use against bacteria. This doesn't exist for viruses. So this is why our number one goal at Capsitech is to develop a programmable antiviral platform based on, on DNA origami. How does this work? Viruses have to bind to the surfaces of cells in order to replicate, to transport their genetic information into the cell. To prevent this initial binding step, we are at Capsitech, we're developing massive shells out of DNA origami. These shells are large enough to fit antivirus particles in their, in their interior. Then we code this interior with virus binding molecules like an antibody, a peptide, polymer, any molecule that binds to a virus. And then viruses can enter these shells via diffusion and become irreversibly trapped. And by, by tra trapping the virus, it's, it can no longer bind to the cell surface and, and is neutralized. So what's our vision? Our vision is to create a plug and play antiviral. So you take any virus binding mole molecule, mount this to the, to the shell, so the vi we call it virus trap, and obtain an antiviral. And, and this is really applicable for many, many different um, viruses. Also, we have resilience against virus mutations, which is a big problem uh, for current antiviral drugs or vaccines. And also, we don't need any detailed knowledge about the target virus, so we can also prepare for future viruses we, that, that we don't know yet. And the good news is this, this works. So what you see here, it's again also not a model, it's a reconstruction obtained with cryo-electron microscopy of a chikungunya particle that is the sphere in the center that is trapped by, by such a DNA shell. So the, the size of this is about 85 nanometers, um, which is uh, one million times smaller than a tennis ball. And you see that the, the DNA shell very nicely catches this virus. 
And this is just one example. So we've, we've created a library of different shells to really cover the, 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 all these sizes of viruses. So on the left is half an octahedron, which would, would fit smaller viruses. On the right, it's, it's a partial icosahedron for bigger viruses like the chikungunya virus I just showed you. And with this library, we trapped many, many different viruses. So we trapped AAVs, polio, dengue, noro, human papillomavirus, SARS-CoV-2, chikungunya, influenza, rubella, and adenoviruses. And the, the only thing we really uh, we needed to change was the size of the shell. So for the smaller viruses like polio, dengue, we used the, the half octahedron, which is a smaller shell. For the adenovirus, which is uh, larger, we, we, had, we had to use a, a, a larger shell. And what I really like about this slide is that all the viruses here on the left were trapped with the same coating on the inside of the shell. So we used a polymer that has some broad spectrum affinity to many different um, viruses. So we could really use the same shells to trap different viruses. So this really demonstrates the, the broad spectrum activity of, of the shells. We not only trapped many viruses, we also tested the neutralization in cell culture, and we could show for now five different viruses that we can effectively neutralize the virus in cell culture. We also started to do in vivo experiments, so we established the safety and tolerability of our compound, so we gave the virus traps to mice and didn't, didn't see any severe side effects. So they were very well tolerated. It's only made out of DNA. And currently we're testing the, the efficacy of the shells um, also in vivo with in infectious viruses. So mice get infected with a virus and then they get, they're treated with the, with the virus trap to mitigate the virus, viral disease. So what, what we usually call it, we, we don't put human in quarantine, but we put the virus in quarantine. And yeah, that's what we're doing at, at Capsitech. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I would like to t take the last few minutes of our session to talk a little bit about SPRINT, the Federal Agency for Disruptive Innovation that funds all these projects and that I'm also a part of. At SPRINT, um, we're looking for disruptive innovation and we're really looking everywhere. We're looking at research institutions, universities, we're looking at companies and we're also looking at individuals that uh, create something amazing in the garages. So if you think that you're working on a disruptive innovation, please talk to us. Over there, there's Rafa Laguna, the guy you see on the picture, who's, who's the CEO of Sprint. Um, and um, for us at Sprint, it's really important that uh, the innovations we support are truly disruptive. That means they need to be so novel that they can create an entirely new industry or change an existing one fu so fundamentally for a better future. So why did we choose DNA origami as a disruptive technology? Well, our thinking here is actually quite simple. A couple of centuries ago, we as humankind developed the ability to engineer machines. And today, we don't have 10 machines or 1,000 machines. We actually have millions of machines that make our daily lives easier. And if DNA origami gives us the ability to engineer machines on the nanoscale, a similar development will happen. And in the future, we'll have thousands of nanorobots that do important tasks for us, like uh, curing cancer or medical diagnostics or uh, avoiding viral infection, and with that, the next pandemic. So I'd like to thank you very much for coming, for listening to us. And we are all very excited about what we do, and we love to talk about it. So we're all standing over there. If anybody has questions, we're super happy to answer them.